So now we have this expression, the price for the blueprints, which is the discounted stream of operating profits, so the integral over profits from time t up to infinity, with the discount factor being um, equal to e to the minus of the integral of the interest rate from time t to time tau. And we want to calculate the derivative of this with respect to time. And now, before we start writing down the result, it yeah, makes life easier when we do the calculations for the derivative of the boundaries with respect to time already at this stage. So we see the upper bound of the integral is infinity. If we take the derivative with respect to time, the result is zero because time doesn't show up. The derivative of the lower bound of the integral, that's t, the derivative with respect to t is obviously 1. Then the derivative of r of s with respect to t is 0, because here time does not uh, show up as such, time only shows up in the boundaries of the integral in the exponent. And what's also important um, for the next calculations is that the derivative of operating profits with respect to time is zero along the balance growth path of this model. And why is this the case? That's the case because we've seen previously that profits of intermediate goods producers can be expressed as one minus alpha times alpha over aggregate output divided by the number of um, uh, firms or technology, uh, the level of technologies. And along the balance growth path, we know by definition that um, per capita uh, GDP will grow at the same rate as uh, technolo uh, technological progress. Um, the technologies progress, basically. So the growth rate of Y will be the growth rate of A, such that this expression does not grow along the long run balance growth path because the numerator and the denominator grow at the same rate. And therefore, we know the time derivative of operating profits along the long-run balance growth path will be zero. Now we apply the Leibniz rule to our expression of the change in the price of the blueprints. Now what we recognize is actually that we have to apply the Leibniz rule twice because first when we take the derivative of the expression inside the integral with respect to time, then we have time showing up in uh, operating profits. So we take the time derivative of pi multiplied by e to the power of uh, minus the uh, integral of the interest rate from t to tau and integrated over s and the whole expression integrated over tau. Um, so the second term here remains unchanged but according to the product rule since time shows up here as well um, we then have to add the derivative of this expression uh, where we have the operating profits constant and take the derivative of the exponent with respect to time. Now if we take the derivative of the exponent with respect to time, we see that uh, here we again have to apply the um, Leibniz rule because here as well, if we take the derivative, um, we have uh, the um, partial derivative of uh, the integral itself and the partial derivative of the two boundaries. So. If we take this integral, uh, this derivative, we again have the first um, term of the Leibniz rule, the partial derivative of the interest rate with respect to time, uh, and the integral from time t to time uh, tau. Plus, then we have the interest rate at the upper bound of the integral, uh, tau, and the derivative of tau with respect to t, minus we have the lower bound. Uh, so we are uh, set for r as we. Um, set in t, substitute in t, so we have rt and we have the derivative of t with respect to t and the whole expression here is multiplied by minus 1 because the exponent here is minus 1 and then we have to add um, the two remaining terms of the Leibniz rule that we have in the first step, namely the price of the patents at the upper bound of the integral of infinity times infinity derived with respect to time, minus the uh, function itself in the integral, uh, pi times, so, so pa uh, at the lower bound, which is t, so that's pi, um, and multiplied by the discount factor, and we have this whole expression here. So that's basically a straightforward application of the Leibniz rule, but 
we have to apply it twice because in this term inside the integral we have to apply the product rule and in the product rule we see also that the exponent of the second term depends on time and we have to apply uh, the Leibniz rule here as well. Now what we see is we have in the first term the time derivative of operating profits and that's according to our previous slide equal to zero so the first term drops out here. The second term remains, so we have the integral from t to infinity of operating profits times the discount uh, factor integrated over tau. Now what do we have inside the squared brackets? Well, inside the squared brackets, and if we multiply this already with minus 1, we have here um, the derivative of r of s with respect to t. t does not show up here, so the derivative is 0. Now here we have uh, r of tau and the derivative of tau with respect to t, which is also zero. So we also have zero here. And here we have r of t multiplied with the derivative of t with respect to t, which is obviously one. If we multiply it by minus one, and here we also have a minus sign, then we get plus r inside the squared brackets. Now here, the first term is also equal to zero because uh, infinity, the derivative of infinity with respect to t is zero. So the first term is zero, and the second term here is just um, minus uh, operating profits and e to the power of zero because here we have the integral from t to t, so that's zero, e to the power of zero is one, so we have minus pi here. So if we summarize the whole thing, then what we get is this expression here, which we already know, that's um, uh, the price of blueprints PA from the previous slides multiplied by the interest rate R at the time T and here we subtract operating profits. So what we get is that the time derivative of the price of the blueprint uh, is equal to the interest rate multiplied by the price of the blueprint minus the operating profits. And now this is a no arbitrage relationship that has to hold in equilibrium and it has a very intuitive explanation to which we come on the next slide. Well, equation two is what we derived on the previous slide. So the time derivative of the price of blueprints is equal to the interest rate multiplied by the price of the blueprint uh, minus operating profits. And we can just rearrange this, so we bring by to the left hand side, say, um, and um, then we have a pi plus the derivative of the price of blueprints with respect to time is equal to uh, the interest rate multiplied by the price of blueprints. And now this is a standard no arbitrage equation that has to hold in an interior equilibrium of the financial market, basically, where households can invest in two types of assets. So they can either buy uh, the shares of an intermediate goods producer, so invest in a firm, or they can uh, accumulate physical capital. Now if they have the amount PA at their disposal, if they invest in physical capital, the return of their investment would be the interest rate multiplied by the amount that they invested in the first place, which is PA. If instead they choose to invest in the shares of an intermediate goods producer, what they get is they get uh, the profits that the intermediate goods producer um, generates, so that's operating profits. They are just redistributed to the owners of the firm. So they get the profits plus they get all the potential valuation gains of the shares. So if shares appreciate in value, then that's also what the household earns because the household can sell the share at a later price, at a higher price later on. So basically what has to hold in an interior uh, capital market equilibrium in this case is that the rate of return on investing in standard physical capital has to be equal to the rate of return of investing in uh, the shares of intermediate goods producers. Now the reason why this has to be equal is there is no risk in the model, so we don't have risk premium and so on. Both investments are kind of risk-free investments, so both investments have to deliver the same rate of return. 
There is another important interaction, the interaction between consumers and firms, particularly when it comes to a consumption and savings decision. Remember, households save assets and these assets are used either to accumulate physical capital, which is then used as a variable production factor by intermediate goods producers, or household savings are used to buy the shares of the intermediate goods producers, so to finance basically the purchase of blueprints on behalf of intermediate goods producers. Now what do consumers do? They behave as in the ramsey cass koopmans model. So we've already solved actually their dynamic optimization problem. And I just describe it briefly here again. So consumers maximize their lifetime utility determined by an isoelastic instantaneous utility function. So C is raised to the power of one minus theta and the denominator also has one minus theta. And the discount factor is E to the power of minus rho T, where rho is the time preference rate or the rate of impatience of households. The integral goes from time zero to infinity. We integrate over time and households maximize this stream of lifetime utility by optimally choosing consumption. Now they maximize this subject to the standard constraint that we already know, um, but now we assume that the rate of depreciation is equal to zero, as Roma did in his paper, and the rate of population growth is zero. So the derivative of assets with respect to time is equal to the wage rate multiplied by inelastically supplied labor, which is normalized to one, plus asset income, which is the interest rate multiplied by assets, but assets consist of two different uh, forms now, either shares of intermediate goods producers or the physical capital in the economy, but that doesn't matter because both of them in equilibrium will be compensated by the rate of return on um, capital, which is due to the no arbitrage relationship that we derived before. Now this is total income, so wage income plus asset income, and here we have total consumption, so the difference between the two is savings. If it's positive, assets accumulate, so households accumulate savings. If it's negative, assets decumulate, households um, run into debt, basically. Now, the maximization problem is as before, basically, and the result of the maximization problem is the by now very familiar keynes ramsey rule or consumption Euler equation telling that consumption expenditure growth is a function of the interest rate minus the rate of depreciation divided by the coefficient theta of the isoelastic utility function that determines the risk aversion of households in a stochastic setting and it determines the elasticity of intertemporal substitution, namely how willing households are to depart from consumption smoothing if they are offered a higher interest rate. Now the interest rate will be endogenous as before in the ramsey cass koopmans model and the consumption Euler equation is one of the equations that can be used to determine the interest rate in equilibrium because it basically provides the supply of savings of households and if we have the demand for savings from the firm side in the economy which we will derive uh, later on we'll have another equation and then we can solve um, for the endogenous interest rate and substitute it out of the system of dynamic uh, equations. By the way, we will have three dynamic equations in the end describing the evolution of the model economy, so an additional equation to the ramsey cass koopmans model. And this three-dimensional system will then be solved for the three endogenous variables. Now a side remark at this stage, and that is that we can derive the economy-wide resource constraint by aggregating actually over the um, dynamic budget constraints of the households. So we have that the capital stock, the evolution of the capital stock over time would be equal to what um, final goods um, assemblers earn in market wages. So that's the wage rate multiplied by the number of final goods assemblers there are in the economy. So the first type of labor plus overall capital income in the economy, which is the interest rate multiplied by the uh, capital stock, plus what we have in terms of aggregate profits in the economy, because that is um, the income of uh, the researchers, or it's also equal to uh, income of uh, those who uh, own the firms. So that's total income in the economy, and if we subtract consumption, we have uh, basically how the capital stock accumulates. Now we can substitute a lot out. So we have the wage rate, as we know, was 1 minus alpha uh, aggregate GDP divided by L time uh, um, uh, Y, so the number of workers in the final goods sector. If you multiply it by L Y, then the denominator and this cancels out, and what remains is 1 minus alpha times Y. 
Here r times k is equal to alpha squared times y, so you can check this if you plug it into the expressions we have here. So rk is alpha pk, which is equal to alpha squared times p times ax. You can look it up from before, and that's equal to alpha squared y. The profits in the, in the intermediate goods sector, aggregate profits of this sector, we've derived it before, it's 1 minus alpha times alpha y. And we have consumption here. And once we solve for all that, that depends on y, what we get is y here. So these three terms add up to y minus c. And that's the aggregate resource constraint. So the change in the capital stock in the economy is equal to aggregate output minus aggregate consumption. And that's the standard resource constraint of macroeconomic models. Well, um, it can also be used as a side constraint in the optimization problem instead of the individual um, oil equation, uh, the individual capital accumulation equation or asset accumulation equation, particularly when we talk about the aggregate economy and, uh, for example, a social planner, because the social planner would not face uh, prices and so on, but it would still face an aggregate resource constraint. The initial capital stock is given by K0, and the standard transversality condition holds as before. Now we have all the ingredients to solve for the equilibrium and the long-run balanced growth path of the economy. And note that this is not necessarily the same, so I think it's often used interchangeably in the literature, but the equilibrium, the market equilibrium of the economy is basically the situation where the market's clear. But that need not yet be the long-run balanced growth path, because it could still be the case that we face adjustment dynamics during which the different variables grow at different rates, and the rates might not be constant over time such that we would still have a transition towards the long-run balanced growth path, although the econom economy is in equilibrium, meaning that markets are cleared. And often these two things are not really held apart. And also Roma in his paper refers to the long-run balanced growth path as an equilibrium, which is an equilibrium, but it's the dynamic equilibrium and the market equilibrium from, from an economic perspective would rather be the equilibrium when markets clear. So we keep these two distinct. We refer to the concept of an equilibrium when markets clear and to the concept of the balanced growth path when the growth rates of the variables don't change anymore. Now what we know first is that we don't have population growth. That means that aggregate variables and per capita variables coincide. So lowercase c, which is per capita consumption, and uppercase c, which is aggregate consumption, coincide. And the same holds true for per capita GDP and aggregate GDP. Now we assume that all markets clear, so we have an economic equilibrium, and then we assume also that we are along the balanced growth path. So Roma does not solve his model for the transition phase towards the long run um, balanced growth path, uh, but only for the long run balanced growth path itself. And the reason is that the transition period is rather difficult to solve, so one can only do it numerically. There are certain programs and papers around uh, doing that, uh, but analytically one can only solve for the long-run balance growth path. Now, along the long-run balance growth path, all the variables in the economy, GDP, aggregate capital, technology, and consumption, as well as their per capita counterparts, grow at the same and the constant rate. And the reason for why aggregate variables and their per capita counterparts grow at the same rate is that population growth is constant and um, we assume the presence of a representative individual again, which means that um, per capita variables and aggregate variables coincide. Now we use the balanced growth path, a concept of a balanced growth path, to solve for it basically and along the balanced growth path we know aggregate GDP and technology grows grow both grow at the same rate such that if we look at the expression for profits in the intermediate goods sector they must be constant we've already seen this before uh, where we talked about the fact that the derivative of profits with respect to time is equal to zero. Now we see this immediately when we write down the expression for profits, which is 1 minus alpha times alpha uh, times aggregate GDP divided by the stock of technologies. And if aggregate GDP and the stock of technologies grow at the same rate, then this expression must be constant. But this also tells us that the time derivative of uh, the profits are zero. So if we look at equation two, that means um, that we uh, basically will also have that these two terms will be constant and the prices for blueprints won't change anymore. 
Now, if the prices of blueprints won't change anymore, we have that uh, the interest rate times the price for blueprints has to be equal to operating profits. Now we can plug in the expression that we have for operating profits, that's this expression here, and from that we can then derive a relation, a relationship, that's equation number three, between GDP and the price for blueprints and the stock of technologies and the interest rate in equilibrium. That will be one of the equations determining the interest rate in equilibrium. And we see this here immediately if we bring this term here to the left hand side. We would have this expression dividing by PA, then we only have the interest rate on the right hand side and we bring one alpha, this alpha here to the right hand side such that we have R over alpha because later on we will see that uh, this relationship is then comes in quite handy when we need to substitute something out of another equation uh, to determine the equilibrium of the model. So that's one of the equilibrium relationships and we refer to it uh, as equation number three later. Then labor market clearing prevails and this requires that the total stock of labor in the economy um, is uh, some so um, consists of all the workers in the final goods sector plus all the scientists. So final goods um, workers, uh, the people who assembly the final good, who assemble the final good, plus the people who are doing research in the R&D sector of the economy. If you add them up, you get the total um, amount of labor in the economy. So there is no unemployment and so on and so forth. And now from this and equation number one that we had, the production function in the research and development sector. So that's basically this equation here we can get the expression that we had later on, where we note that if the total labor in the final goods sector plus labor in the research sector add up to the total amount of labor L, then labor in the research sector, so the scientists, that's equal to the total amount of labor minus the workers in the final goods sector. And that's exactly what we use here in this slide, where we plug L minus LY, which is LA, into this research production uh, function. And we divide by A, the intertemporal knowledge spillover, such that on the left hand side we have the growth rate of technologies, and on the right hand side we have the number of researchers but expressed in terms of aggregate labor minus uh, workers in the final goods sector multiplied by the productivity of the workers in the research and development sector. Next, we can use the um, inverse demand function for labor to substitute out for the workers in the final goods sector from this expression here because we know that the wage rate is given by 1 minus alpha over GDP, uh, times GDP divided by the number of workers in the final goods sector. Now we can isolate instead of the wages on the left hand side we bring the number of workers in the final goods sector to the left hand side and we divide by wages and then we get this expression here that we substitute in for the number of workers into the expression that we've derived on the previous slide and then we um, end up at this equation here. Now we can substitute out for the wages uh, here because we know wages for scientists are given as the price uh, that uh, the research sector can charge for blueprints multiplied by the productivity of scientists and that's the inherent productivity of uh, scientists delta A multiplied by the intertemporal knowledge spillovers which also affect the productivity of scientists. So we plug this in and arrive at this expression here. So we've substituted out for one endogenous variable and now we already see we multiply the whole expression by delta A. We have here delta A, so this delta A and this delta A would cancel out once we multiply, which we do in the next step. And in addition, what we have here is 1 minus alpha times aggregate GDP divided by P A and A. And that's exactly the expression that we have here on the left hand side. So we can substitute in and then we have instead of this cumbersome expression, the interest rate divided by alpha. That's exactly what we do here in the next step. So we substitute this in and we multiply by delta, uh, gamma, uh, delta A. So we have delta A times um, the total stock of labor in the economy. And here we have the interest rate over alpha. Now we are almost uh, done with this expression, but still we see that on the right hand side uh, the interest rate shows up and the interest rate is determined endogenously in equilibrium. And it's de determined endogenously by the interaction between firms and households. Now this 
uh, equation was derived on the firm side of the economy and now we have the um, one equation coming from the demand side of the economy from the household side namely the consumption oil equation that also features the interest rate. Now in the consumption oil equation we have the growth rate of consumption on the left hand side but we know consumption and uh, technology the stock of technologies they grow at the same rate because of the very definition of a balanced growth path. So we know we can substitute in here the growth rate of technologies on the left hand side in the oil equation and then we can isolate from the consumption oil equation the interest rate that is we multiply gamma a by theta so we have theta gamma a and we bring rho to the left hand side so we have plus rho and that's then the interest rate and on the next slide we will then substitute the expression for the interest rate into the uh, expression for the growth rate of technologies that we derived on the firm side of the economy. And this is exactly what we have here in the next equation. So here we substituted out for the interest rate um, in this expression by plugging in this expression and what we get is basically this expression and what we see is that we have the growth rate of technologies on the left hand side and on the right hand side of this equation but that's the only variable that we still have that's the endogenous variable we want to solve for all other terms here are exogenous parameter values so we can solve for the growth rate of technologies on the left by bringing gamma a to the left hand side and if we do so the expression that we uh, arrive at is the growth rate the endogenously determined growth rate of the stock of technologies. So that's technological progress which is then determined endogenously. So it's not assumed as an exogenous um, variable as it is in the Solo model or in the ramsey kass koopmans model or in overlapping generations type of models that you know, but it's really determined in an endogenous way because it results um, uh, by means of market forces, of preferences of households and so on and so forth at the equilibrium of the economy. So it's really an equation that derives from the behavior of the different agents in the economy and from the market structure, from the competition structure, basically. And what that, uh, does it tell us? It tells us that the growth rate of the economy increases if we have more researchers uh, in the economy, basically. Um, so if there are more people in the economy, if the, if, if the number of workers is higher, that means that in equilibrium we will also have more researchers. And having more researchers from the knowledge production function, we know this leads to faster technological progress. And faster technological progress is faster growth in the stock of technologies. Having more productive researchers, if delta A is higher, has the same effect. So that's also growth enhancing. Now what reduces the growth rate is if people are more impatient. Why is this the case? If people are impatient, they save less. If they save less, there is less capital and less... Um, uh, uh, so, so there are not so uh, much savings available to invest in the shares of intermediate goods producers. So the demand for technologies would be lower and this decrease in the demand for technologies would reduce the growth rate of the economy. So people are not willing to invest as much in new technologies if they are more impatient. And that makes also sense from an intuitive point of view. So a society that is more impatient would probably invest less in technologies, the um, gains of which accrue in the future, but the costs of which accrue currently. If theta is higher, that means households are more risk averse. They prefer consumption smoothing, so you need a larger difference between the interest rate and the rate uh, time preference rate to induce a certain savings behavior in them, that would have a similar effect. So if theta is higher, also the growth rate of the economy would go down. So basically, most of these effects are rather intuitive and uh, clear, but nevertheless, one result in particular has been criticized quite um, severely after the model was introduced in the beginning 1990s and that is the effect that the growth rate of the economy increases with the size of the economy basically in terms of the population size. And this effect that the growth rate of the economy increases if the economy itself is larger has become known as the strong scale effect. So a larger market 
um, and more researchers would boost uh, technological progress. Now, while this is somehow intuitive, it's refuted by empirical evidence. First of all, the first line of attack was that people stated, well, we don't see this. We don't see that larger countries grow faster than smaller ones. For example, if you compare Canada and the United States, then the long-run growth rate of these countries is rather similar, uh, although the United States is much um, larger than Canada. The same holds true for Germany and the United States, as we've already seen. Germany is, uh, the United States are four times um, larger in terms of the population size than Germany. Nevertheless, the growth rates of the two countries are uh, remarkably similar. Or for that matter, compare uh, Germany to Switzerland. Also, Germany is much larger than Switzerland, but the growth rate of their economies is rather similar. So the strong scale effect across different countries does not seem to be borne out in the data. However, uh, this is somehow also a misleading interpretation because we know technologies, ideas, flow quite easily across borders. So it might just be the case that uh, technologies determined in the uh, developed in the United States or in Japan or so on also become available in other countries. So then the worldwide technological frontier would actually grow and one does not um, need to have to concentrate on different countries and one must not make this comparison between different countries. But what we would be interested in is actually how... Uh, the stock of technologies grows uh, within a set of homogeneous countries that are the drivers of the worldwide technological frontier. For example, all OECD countries together, or say the G7 countries, which are the main drivers of uh, technological progress at the worldwide level. But if we look at that, then still there is one aspect that is difficult to reconcile with the model, and that is that we saw the number of scientists in the OECD or in the G7 increase tremendously over the last decades. So the number of researchers and of people working in the research and development sector um, increased by a factor of 10 since the Second World War. So now if this model is an accurate description of reality, then we would see according to the research production function here that this huge increase in the number of researchers would have led to a huge increase also in the growth rate of the economies. However, despite this huge increase in the number of researchers in the research and development sector, the growth rate of the different countries in the second half of the 20th century remained rather stable. So this huge uh, increase in LA did not lead to an increase in technological progress. And that um, kind of um, questions the validity of this uh, strong uh, scale effect, um, again, also from an empirical uh, perspective. And Jones, uh, in an influential paper in 1995, also criticized this strong scale effect, and he came up with a model that removes the strong scale effect, but he still has a, a weak scale effect, as we will see in the next uh, chapter. But the model is uh, able to better capture what we see in the data than the research and development based endogenous growth model of Roma. What is interesting in this context is that along the balanced growth path, the aggregate model has a similar structure as the Ramsey Cass Koopmans model. So again, it encompasses actually the Ramsey Cass Koopmans model, but it has a third equation, and the third equation is the one that determines the growth rate of technologies. So basically, the Roma model is a three dynamic equation model. So it's a, um, in the end, one would have a system of three dynamic equations where one additional equation determines the evolution of uh, technologies, technological progress endogenously. So um, we can basically describe why in different countries the stock of technologies grows at a faster rate than uh, in others. Now, and this solves the problem that we talked about in the beginning of this chapter, um, Capital is not anymore paid according to its marginal product because the interest rate is alpha squared y over k. So in the standard model, it would be with, a, with perfect competition only alpha times y over k. So actually, the missing factor payments are then used to compensate the researchers in the model. And this is the reason why we can have endogenous growth, why we can have monopolistic competition in the model, such that in the end, um, total income is then used to compensate three different um, uh, 
types of production factors. The two different types of labor, the workers and the scientists, and the production factor capital. So monopolistic firms in this context earn overall pro uh, do not earn overall profits, they earn operating profits. Be aware of the difference. And the discounted stream of these operating profits is used to pay for equipment. So that's the fixed cost of production. And due to this monopolistic competition structure, we can compensate research and development in this model. And we have incentives to invest in research and development in this model. And that's the incentives that determine the long-run balanced growth rate. Now, this contrasts quite a bit with uh, earlier models um, that I've told you about, where the government basically invested in basic science, so there was a tax rate or something like that, and the, government, the proceeds of the tax were used to employ researchers, and they came up with basic research, the laws of uh, nature, and so on and so forth, but there was no profit-driven research and development, and here we would really have profit-driven research and development, where firms purposefully invest in research and development to gain an edge over their competitors. In reality, as I told you, you would have both. You would have basic research and applied research, and there are models around um, doing that and um, uh, using a government to uh, finance basic research uh, and as a, a, a firm sector to fund applied research. And the result of these models is that there is a certain degree of complementarity between these two types of research, which is intuitively clear. Another aspect worth mentioning is that there is a possibility of stagnation. If you look at the long-run balance growth path of the economy and the long-run balance growth rate, then we see that in the numerator, we could in principle have um, that this is zero or even negative. And this could be the case if the productivity of scientists is small. So if delta A is, say, zero, then uh, the numerator would be negative. If the market is small, so if the number of uh, people living in an economy is small, um, that would imply uh, only a few researchers in the economy, and also then it could in principle be that the numerator is negative. And of course, if households are very impatient, so if rho is rather high, this could lead to such a situation. Um, and also, if monopoly is uh, too strong, then there wouldn't be an incentive to do research and development anymore for somebody who is already has a monopoly. Um, then one would also not have uh, research and development. Um, and of course, um, one cannot have negative employment in research and development. So in this case, one would be in an Aquana solution with zero employment in research and development, and the Roma model abstracts from technological regress. And so in this case, one would have stagnation. So the growth rate of technology would be zero, the number of uh, scientists in the R&D sector would be zero, and there is stagnation in this case. So the possibility of a corner solution with stagnation emerges. Overall, the model captures quite nicely efficiency gains due to specialization, according to Adam Smith. So you have that the more intermediate goods there are, the more productive these goods become. So that's kind of the aspect uh, that the model captures of Adam Smith's specialization um, argument that you could have increasing productivity by this specialization. However, there is no obsolescence yet, so no creative destruction. According to the Roma model, you just have that each new innovation generates a new good, but all the goods are not driven out of the market. So in principle, you could have uh, modern cars at the same time as ox carriages at work, which is not such a realistic feature of the model. However, others, Grossman and Helpman and Aguillon and Howitt, have built models that take this uh, Schumpeterian aspect of creative destruction into account. And in their case, innovation is not um, horizontal, such that it increases the number of uh, intermediate uh, goods or varieties in the intermediate goods sector, but instead an innovation would be a quality improvement. So it would lead to a more productive intermediate good, and that would drive the older um, variety of this good out of business, basically. And then you have a business dealing effect um, where older firms are driven out of business due to technological progress. And this could have implications for welfare, because in the Roma model, um, you would have that uh, technological progress is always welfare increasing. So uh, if you calculate the social optimum, you would have that the social planner would invest more in research and development than uh, uh, 
the, the, the households in the market um, equilibrium, so in the decentralized solution of the model, because it always increases overall welfare to have uh, faster technological progress. In Grossman and Heldman, however, you have a negative um, effect, uh, namely that all the firms are driven out of business, and this could lead to a situation in which technological progress might be so high that it is already socially uh, not optimal anymore. But this cannot happen in the standard Roma model. And this leads us directly to the interpretation of the externalities that are present in the model. So, as you know, the standard ramsey kass koopmans model does not have any externalities. So if you solve the ramsey kass koopmans model for the market solution, which we did previously, then the market solution is the same as the solution that a social planner would choose. And this has the advantage that uh, you can arrive at the market solution sometimes by just uh, calculating the social planner solution, which is sometimes easier to obtain, and then you would also have the market solution of the model. This is not the case in the Roma model because there are externalities, and if you have externalities, the market solution will differ from the socially optimal solution. Now, what are these externalities? The first and most prominent one, and probably also the most important one in this context, is the standing on shoulders externality in research and development. So firms and scientists cannot cash in this effect, and this effect is that previous research makes future research more productive, or as Isaac Newton said, if I've been able to look further, that is because I have been standing on the shoulders of giants, so therefore it's the standing on shoulders effect. You build on past research to uh, generate future research, so past research makes future research more likely. And this intertemporal spillover effect could lead to huge welfare gains, but this effect cannot be taken into account, uh, cannot be cashed in, so firms or researchers uh, cannot in any way um, make money out of this intertemporal um, spillover effect. And that, of course, implies, this spillover effect implies the technological progress in this model will always be too low as compared to the social optimal technological progress rate, which would take this into account. So a social planner allocating uh, research um, in an optimal way would choose a, a higher number of uh, researchers, of scientists, than uh, in the market solution exactly to um, take advantage of this effect and to internalize this effect, basically. So that's the most prominent uh, spillover effect in the Roma model. Now, there is another positive externality um, that is related to the development of new intermediate products because the innovators who develop these new intermediate products, they can only see from the producer's rent. So the profits that firms uh, generate out of that, but not the consumer's rent. So consumers also benefit due to technological progress and the consumer's rent, of course, cannot be cashed in and this is also a positive externality. And then there is a negative externality due to monopolistic uh, competition in the intermediate goods sector. And this externality means that too few intermediates will be produced as compared to the social optimum. So the social optimum would be the one where you um, have marginal cost pricing, so more intermediates would be produced. And as compared to this situation, monopolistic competition implies that um, the firms produce less than the um, optimal amount that would lead to uh, marginal cost pricing. So that's a negative externality. Now sensible economic policy could try and should try to internalize these external effects and could therefore generate faster economic growth and faster technological progress. Now how could this be achieved? Well one way um, particularly to um, internalize the first two um, externalities would be to uh, subsidize research and development. Um, so that, of course, uh, could be by taxing uh, household income or whatever and subsidizing the wages of researchers in the model or subsidizing the development of new goods to some extent. So that could help to internalize the first effect um, and the second effect. Now, theoretically, one could also subsidize intermediate goods production such that uh, firms would produce more and the losses that they would make out of that is, are then captured, uh, uh, are covered by the state to some extent. But that's more a theoretical 
possibility that that does not occur in reality that often, but subsidizing R&D, that occurs quite frequently at almost all states in the world, to some extent subsidize research and development, which, according to the Roma model, would be a sensible strategy. It would internalize externalities and it would be growth enhancing in such an R&D-based economic growth model. Now, this closes the discussion of the R&D-based endogenous growth model of Roma, so this breakthrough that occurred in the 1990s where it was for the first time possible to derive the long-run balanced growth rate endogenously in this uh, framework. But as I said before, there has been some criticism on this model, particularly on the strong scale effect. And in the next chapter, we will discuss um, and yeah, uh, how people addressed this strong scale effect and in particular how Jones in his influential 1995 paper um, addressed the strong scale effect and come, came up with a model formulation of this R&D based growth model that uh, fit better to uh, the uh, until then observed trajectories of population growth and uh, income growth to some extent in OECD countries. <music>